According to Greta Thunberg, humanity only has three months left. Joe Biden releases his woke green budget proposal, plus over 1,000 migrants try to force their way through a border checkpoint in El Paso. All that and more, I'm Bobby Eberly. This is a 13-minute news hour. God bless the United States of America. Okay, friends, welcome to the show. Happy Monday. Hope you had a great weekend. If you're new to the show, thank you so much for tuning in. We're going to start with the end of the world because those on the radical left keep preaching about climate gloom and doom, and yet they are wrong over and over and over again. Here's Democrat Al Gore from 2009. And this is the volumetric record of the ice. And uh, some of the models suggest to... Dr. Maslowski, that there is a 75% chance that the entire North Polar ice cap during summer, during some of the summer months could be completely ice free within the next five to seven years. Okay, so in 2014 or 2016, we're going to lose the North Polar ice cap. It will all be melted, at least part of the time. No. And by the way, Gore is still at it. Here he is at the World Economic Forum from just last month. We are not winning. The crisis is still getting worse faster than we are deploying these solutions. And we need to make changes quickly. Emissions are still going up. All these promises of the last few years to cut emissions, emissions are still going up. That's Al Gore. But remember Beto O'Rourke bouncing up and down about the climate? This is our final chance the scientists are absolutely unanimous on this, that we have no more than 12 years to take incredibly bold action on this crisis. The big red flag there, of course, was Beto actually saying that scientists are unanimous on this 12-year prediction. That was four years ago, and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez jumped on that bandwagon as well. Millennials and people, and you know, Gen Z and all these folks that come after us are looking up and we're like, the world is gonna end in 12 years if we don't address climate change. And your biggest issue is, your, your biggest issue is how are we gonna pay for it? Just so you know, the world ending in 12 years claim was debunked by the Associated Press. But climate activist Greta Thunberg took it a step further. You remember her, right? She's the non-scientist teenager who was suddenly the go-to expert on climate change. You all come to us young people for hope. How dare you? You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words. Well, instead of 12 years, Thunberg was predicting five. A top climate scientist is warning that climate change will wipe out all of humanity unless we stop using fossil fuels in the next five years. As you saw, that tweet was dated June 21st, 2018. So brace yourselves, because we only have about three months left. And oops, the reason that tweet is now making news is because Greta just deleted it from her Twitter feed. But, but the scientists are unanimous, right? All right, next let's talk about Joe Biden's budget. But first, if you're new to the show or haven't subscribed yet, regardless of platform, just search out my name, hit that subscribe button, make sure notifications are turned on. That way you can follow the show and help us grow. So Joe Biden made a rare public appearance to talk about his new $7 trillion budget proposal. And right on cue, Biden bashed the rich who managed to pay for nearly all of the taxes, yet somehow never pay their fair share. Biden also spoke at the White House regarding his new budget and described it this way. Building a budget requires some really hard decisions. But all over America, families are sitting around their kitchen tables making decisions that are equally consequential. That's who my budget is for. It's about a value set, I said yesterday. It's about a value set. Okay, so what kind of values is Biden focusing on in his budget? Let's take a look. President Biden, the Keystone State this week, unveiling a nearly $7 trillion budget, repealing the Trump tax cuts, increasing the corporate tax rate to seven, uh, up seven, seven more percent, increasing the personal tax rate to its highest rate in 40 years, all while ignoring how Americans are supposed to cope with the, this with the cost of eggs. 
this huge seven trillion dollar plan, you know, just for the the president to mention, a climate of 148 times, <clears throat> clean energy 65 times, equity 63 times, and environmental justice 32 times. Just to let you know, Biden's budget uses the word equity more than inflation, the border, and gas combined. That's his value set. But of course, this massive proposal for woke spending uses money America does not have and will only drive inflation even higher. Here's commentary from podcast host Derek Hunter on the budget. It is a shell game for the real problem in Washington, D.C., is that their federal government spends too much money. It doesn't matter how much money that they take in. We're taking in more money than we've ever taken in before by a lot, and we're still running up massive deficits. Nothing Joe Biden has proposed addresses the deficit or the debt. He'll tell you it does, but he's, what's the word I'm looking for? Oh yes, he's lying. More and more spending, not addressing the debt or deficit and pushing a so-called green agenda that will hurt American jobs and hurt American national security interests. This is what happens when we have a president who is controlled by the far left. All right, next let's talk about what's going on at America's southern border because major steps need to be taken and the current administration is not only doing nothing about it, but Biden's policies have encouraged the unprecedented flood of illegal border crossings that we have seen since Biden took office. The policies have also emboldened the drug cartels and the puppet president Lopez Obrador. Just last week, four Americans were kidnapped and two killed by Mexican drug cartel members. Now, you're probably thinking that's too much heat for even a drug cartel to take on. And you'd be partially correct. Turns out that the cartel apologized for the incident. The problem is that there are no repercussions coming from the Biden administration, none at all. As soon as Republicans start talking about going after the drug cartels, what does Obrador do? Does he say the drug cartels need to be stopped? Does he say they, need, they are a scourge on society? No, what he says is that he will interfere with the 2024 election to stop Republicans from winning. Uh, Lopez Obrador yesterday actually threatened the United States, uh, saying uh, that he would uh, he would initiate some sort of a propaganda campaign against Republicans uh, in the during the 2024 election if uh, if they took any kind of action. This is just crazy. Not only do we have to take serious action against the drug cartels, not only do we need to force Mexico to stop funneling people to our border. We also need to see the border situation for what it is, an invasion, and do something about it. Just look at this footage from El Paso over the weekend. Extraordinary pictures. There is over a thousand migrants rushing to the United States port of entry in El Paso, Texas. I'm told these are largely from Venezuela. The migrants, Venezuelan migrants, pushing against the fenced border. Both the U.S. Border Protection and the Mexican military had to work to contain the situation on both sides. This is insane. The border checkpoint had to be closed down as the swarm of over 1,000 people tried to push their way in. We need our military down at the border, and we need to impeach DHS Secretary Mayorkas. His job is to protect the border. He's not doing it. He's refusing to do it. Mayorkas needs to go, and America needs to take action on the drug cartels. All right, next let's talk about the latest proposal by the Los Angeles Police Department, which is sure to not end well. In an effort to help with understaffing, LAPD's union has released a list of calls for service that it believes can be handled by unarmed responders. In other words, this is just a new trend in left-wing cities. Unarmed personnel will be sent in where armed police used to be sent in, when the call is not deemed to need an armed police presence. To me, this makes no sense. If the police are called, send the police. Why would you need to send a cop who is disarmed? All it does is create the possibility for harm against the police and a disregard for law and order. As reported by the Post Millennial, in 2020, while the city, Seattle City Council was voting to defund the police and allocate money to social workers, a social worker was stabbed to death by a homeless client. That same year, San Francisco Mayor London Breed announced that non-criminal calls will be handled by trained unarmed professionals rather than armed police officers. Cities such as San Francisco and Seattle have faced record crime since enacting the practice. Now, some of the items on LAPD's list of non-armed officer incidents include illegal gambling, 
non-criminal mental health calls, landlord-tenant disputes, loitering or trespassing with no indication of danger, and under the influence calls when there is no other crime in progress. Any of those incidents could escalate into a bad situation, but in order to satisfy the vocal left, police will be thrust into situations and not be fully prepared. How does that make anyone safer? All right, now let's talk about a white privilege video that has gone viral. And I'm not showing it to make fun of the guy who's being questioned. I'm showing it because he did the interview and actually was honest in his assessment of why he claims so-called white privilege. Here's how it starts. I, I grew up as a white man and you're the exact opposite, you know? And so it's like my experiences are gonna be different from yours. How come? I think, uh, you know, there is a thing of like white privilege. Uh, what privileges do you have that I don't have? Oh, see, that's a question I keep asking myself. Don't you think it's a problem in society when white people think that they have more privileges than brown or black people? Okay, so that first part sets the stage. The guy starts to say that he has different experiences than that of the interviewer, who is Savannah Hernandez from Turning Point USA. He mentions white privilege, and he is challenged on it right away. What experience does you have that I don't have? Simple question, and he was at a loss for words, because the entire idea is just a bogus left-wing notion that is designed to divide people rather than unite them. Then he was asked about the entire concept of white people thinking they have more privileges than others. In this next part, he attempts to explain. Yeah, and I think that's sort of the agenda that's pushed off because personally, it's like, not that I think I'm more privileged than anyone else because I had to work to get where I was. And that's like the- So why do you have that mentality immediately where you, you know, kind of apologize to me? Like, let's talk about privilege. Let's talk about, I'm a white man in America, so we could have grown up differently. I got you. Why, why is that your first initial reaction to me as a brown woman? Now we are getting somewhere. In his attempt to explain white privilege, he admits that he doesn't think he has any special privileges because he had to work to get where he was. Good for him. But then the natural question arises, and it's the one he was asked. If you don't think you have so-called white privilege, then why did you say it? And now we get to the truth. Wow, you're getting me good. See, these are the kind of conversations that I love having. Um, and I think it comes from a place of like, uh, I wouldn't say caution, but like in this day and age, people are so quick to judge and react and cancel. And so I guess it's that, that like caution to go into an interview like this. I'm like, I, I don't know where we're at, but now I know where we're at and I can like uh, go for real. So there you have it. It's fear. The reason he led with white privilege is the fear of being canceled. And that's exactly what the left is hoping for. Thankfully, through this rare occurrence called a discussion, these two people were able to reveal what is really going on. Rather than censorship and banning and blocking and canceling, maybe what we really need is a little more discussion. Friends, that's our show for today. I hope you enjoyed it. And remember, today's show's one sheet is available to Patreon supporters using the link in the description. The one sheet gives you the links to all the videos and stories used on today's show so you can dive even deeper into each issue. And with that, our next show will be Wednesday evening at the usual time. Until then, I'm Bobby Eberly. This is a 13-minute news hour. All right, friends, thanks again for tuning in. I really appreciate it. And before you go, please hit that subscribe button above. Once you do, tell your friends, share it, spread the word about the 13-minute news hour so we can keep growing. And for more great content, Check out these videos right here, and I'll see you next time.